In Berlin, on the 2nd of October 1942, Rommel was presented with the Field Marshal's baton by Hitler. Rommel appeared to be a loyal follower of the regime, but appearances were deceptive. He no longer believed victory was possible in North Africa. Soon, he would doubt Hitler himself. In the early hours of the 21st of June, 1942, the British forces in the fortress of Tobruk in Libya surrendered. 33,000 British soldiers were taken prisoner. Rommel had been leading German and Italian troops in North Africa for more than 16 months. Tobruk was the pinnacle of Rommel's military career. As a result, Hitler made him a field marshal. The victors were exultant. The British in despair. We were lined up by our officers in the usual threes, and there we were standing, having blown up our equipment. I think there was a terrible feeling of shame, and particularly we felt that as the Australians had, had held it, we have uh, ducked it away and uh, I, I, we were not happy about that. At the same time in Washington, Churchill was visiting Roosevelt. During their talks, Churchill heard that Tobruk had fallen. His chief of staff later wrote in his memoirs. For the first time in my life, I saw the prime minister wince. But what I remember so clearly was Mr. Churchill was in Washington with visiting President Roosevelt when that happened. And I think he must have felt a sense of shame because so many soldiers had surrendered. And Mr. Roosevelt immediately said, what can we do to help you? And he offered him a lot of Sherman tanks which were going to be sent to the American forces who were in North Africa, but they were now to be given to the British. And Mr. Churchill never forgot that generous gesture. A little later, the USA decided to participate in the conflict in North Africa. The first supply convoys left the USA just 10 days after the fall of Tobruk. This sealed the fate of the German forces. The question of reinforcements was actually the key to success or failure. We knew from reports approximately what reinforcements the British had at their disposal, and we already had experience of what reinforcements actually arrived for us. So it was to be expected with the kind of superiority the British had then that our side would not be able to hold its position. After the fall of Tobruk, the British Eighth Army withdrew. Rommel had no choice but to exploit the advantage he now had. If he wanted to beat the British, he had to pursue them. He gave orders for an advance into Egypt, where the majority of the British forces were stationed. I think it was a kind of instinct for pursuit that made him say, don't leave the enemy in peace, he's been routed. Keep after him, whatever the circumstances, and I think that he sometimes went too far. He demanded too much of the troops. He didn't wait for the reinforcements. There was boundless optimism not just from Rommel, but from the whole staff. 
We saw ourselves in Cairo already. We were already wondering which hotel we would go to, where we would live, and in which hotel we should have our HQ. The mood was completely euphoric. And I know that the idea discussed was more or less to meet up in Palestine with groups that arrived from the Caucasus. That was the plan. We would come over the Suez Canal from the south and the troops from the Caucasus from the north, and we would join up. That was a very clear plan. The British retreated along the coast road towards Egypt. On the 29th of June, Masa Matru fell. It was now only 150 kilometers to Alexandria, where the Royal Navy was already evacuating the port. In Cairo, staff in British headquarters were burning their files. On the 29th of June, Mussolini landed in Libya. He didn't intend to miss the German-Italian victory parade in Alexandria. We all thought Rommel would win. He only had to get to Cairo. Furthermore, according to Egyptian politicians, whom I got to know after the war, they were ready to form a government that was favorably disposed to the Axis. And the British in Cairo had already begun to retreat after they lost the battle of Marsa Matru. This place marked the turning point in the North African War and in Rommel's career. The British war correspondent, Dennis Johnston, described it. A small railway station set in the midst of some hundreds of miles of absolutely nothing. That is El Alamein. And I looked on the map and saw this little mark on the map on the coast. El Alamein. I didn't realize then how famous it would become. And eventually, we, it took us about two days, and we got back to uh, this place. And I could see the uh, in British infantry and the, and the artillery digging in uh, right across the desert. A hundred kilometers from the gates of Alexandria, General Auchinleck, commander in chief of the British Army in the Middle East, improvised the last line of defense. It was the narrowest point between the coast and the impassable Katara depression, and the tank units had to pass through it. When we arrived in El Alamein, I saw the laughably few tanks which were available for us in the tank unit and the other vehicles. And I realized how exhausted the soldiers were. Our fighting strength was only a fraction of what it should have been. Then I realized that it could not go on. Not like that. At the same time, British airmen achieved superiority in the air for the first time in North Africa. Their airfields were nearby. Their reinforcement system was working well. We were dive bombed and stuck at once at El Alamein, and out high up came the Allied fighters down, and they virtually wiped out the Stukert. They didn't stand a chance. And that was the turning point where we realized the Allies were now superior in the Air Force, and that at that was the turning point that encouraged us. The tide had turned in the war on the ground as well. Heavy fighting at El Alamein put a stop to Rommel's advance at the beginning of July, 1944. I can still picture Rommel now. 
he was in such a rage. He just stood there and couldn't grasp what had happened over three or four kilometers. It was quite clear to me then that we had reached the point where we couldn't possibly go on. Rommel's position at Al Alamein became more critical by the day. Dearest Lou, it can't go on like this or the front will collapse. These are the hardest days of my military life. You know that I'm an incorrigible optimist, but there are places where it's completely dark. You're Irvin. Now Rommel only showed confidence for the cameras. Günter Halm ist erst 19 Jahre alt. Als Richtschütze einer Pack schoss er unter schwierigsten Bedingungen sieben Britenpanzer ab. Ich bitte Sie zu dieser Auszeichnung und hoffe, dass Sie die gesund nach Hause bringen. Wer so ein Kerl ist, der wird immer so ein Kerl sein. Bei jeder Gelegenheit. Das erwarte ich natürlich von Ihnen. Als ich mich freiwillig. I joined up because I just had to go and do my bit. I had to help. But when I saw the first dead bodies, that's when I first shot a tank. I went over and we opened the hatch. And there sat the driver and the commander, dead, just skeletons. You could see the tank had been completely burned out. It gave me such a shock. And that turned us into deadly, serious, grown-up people. On the 8th of August, 1942, Churchill visited the British troops in North Africa. He was accompanied by Rommel's new opponent, Lieutenant General Bernard Law Montgomery. He had a reputation for being obstinate. I had just taken over Chief of Staff of 7th Armored Division. And this uh, rather small man arrived with a rather large pair of shorts and very white, knobbly knees. Uh, 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 and you thought, who is this curious man <laughs> who's appeared to command the army? And being, uh, having sand encrusted in my shoes, I mean, having been in the desert from the very beginning, we were very suspicious of people who came out from England and hadn't been the dead as before. He wore the black beret of an ordinary tank driver. It was supposed to make him popular with his men. His grim determination also marked him out. There will be no further withdrawal. I have ordered that all plans and instructions dealing with further withdrawal are to be burnt. Our mandate from the Prime Minister is to destroy the Axis forces in North Africa. It can be done, and it will be done. I was cleaning out my firing position where I had my Bren gun. And I just had a pair of shorts on, no shirt. And he stood at the top of the uh, communication trench. And he said to me, how long have you been in the desert, soldier? I said, about 15 months, sir. He said, well, don't worry. He said, you won't be here very much longer. At Bletchley Park, the British Secret Service had been trying to break the German Enigma code for years. Operation Ultra. We didn't read any army Enigma until the second half of 1942. And we didn't, and we, we never read it consistently or promptly. Though at one point we did read it, so that it was operationally valuable. That was to say, we read it. We read one day what they were going to do the next, instead of reading one day what they had done two weeks earlier. And that was really the most important thing about Ultra. Germany still thought their code was absolutely safe. But now the British Secret Service was listening in. Montgomery was one of the first to profit from the new weapon. 
he was now informed of all Rommel's intentions. Montgomery hung Rommel's picture in his quarters, as though it helped him read his mind. This again was another myth. What Monty was really profiting from was not, not reading Rommel's mind from his photograph, but getting ultra. Uh, 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 that's what mattered. No, that, that was a myth. It was all part of his... I mean, it was, he was very clever with his public relations. I mean, uh, 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 he, he took care to see that he had good public relations, and it's a very good thing for a general to have good public relations. As every day went by, the British gained more strength. Rommel, was bekannt. Rommel knew, and I got wind of it too, that the British army was incredibly well provided with reinforcements. Rommel said again and again, if we achieve anything, then it must be as quickly as possible, before the British start their offensive. Rommel's reinforcement situation did not improve. He needed everything, spare parts, ammunition, petrol. Mussolini and Hitler urged Rommel to attack, but he hesitated. He was beginning to feel unwell. At that time, Rommel was in rather poor shape. He had been very overstretched. I had already noticed it because one of my jobs when we were on the road was to see to his food. There were many things where he just said, no, I'm sorry, I don't want any of that. I can't eat that and that his physical condition was decisive in determining his whole psychological and bodily state. I think that's just obvious. I was sure that was it. You often notice that he just didn't have the verve anymore or the energy that he used to. In Massa Matru, on the 24th of August, 1942, Rommel was examined in the army hospital. He'd already asked Hitler for his replacement. His doctor wrote, His present condition is a result of extreme physical and psychological exertion. A nurse did some lab tests. And then he was suddenly supposed to have diphtheria. But diphtheria, a children's illness, really wasn't credible in these circumstances. By diesen Verhältnissen is ziemlich ausgeschlossen. But I had to carry out the tests. Natürlich das Material und there was not a trace of it. Keine Spur. And I gave in a completely negative report. I'm sorry, I can't say it's diphtheria. And I wouldn't, just because Rommel wanted to be sent home from Mars Matru because of ill health. That is the truth. Rommel had no choice. He was not well, but had to get on with the last big offensive. The morning before the attack, he spoke to his doctor. Professor, the decision to attack today is the hardest of my life. Either we will succeed in taking Grozny in Russia and reaching the Suez Canal here in Africa, or... He said to us, you know that the British have infinite superiority over us, don't you? He always spoke to us in a mixture of personal and formal. And we said, of course, sir, we know that, but we will sort it out. On the 30th of August, 1942, Rommel's troops took up their positions. His opponent, Montgomery, knew every detail of the plan because of the ultra code-breaking system. We expect him in there, we had everything ready, everything went entirely according to plan. 
In fact, it went even better in a way because we delayed, I mean, we, we delayed new minefields there north of Hermione and, and, and we managed to delay much longer than we expected. Rommel's last offensive started in the evening. His troops marched to their destruction. And the word came that the Germans were going to break through. And we were told, don't fire at them. Just let them go by. And he said, then when the infantry and the supply wagons come through, take, take them on and knock them out. Well, the Germans, about 50 tanks went through. And the, as I say, the infantry, well, we knocked them out. After three days, Rommel had to stop. It was all over. The mood at Rommel's HQ was dismal. When we are yet if we don't win El Alamein, Africa is lost. I said, sir, the war is lost. He took my arm and we walked 300 meters into the desert. Then he said, who else have you said that to? And I said, nobody else. You must not say things like that. I wouldn't be able to protect you. You can say anything to me in private, but nowhere else. I think we understand each other. Rommel left Africa on the 23rd of September. He was supposed to take a health cure. After his recovery, Hitler wanted to send him to the east. But when he left, Rommel made a promise. If fighting breaks out, I will break off my cure and come straight back to Africa. That was the only thing that really demoralized us, that Rommel had left. We kept asking, will he or won't he come back? It made us suspicious. We felt protected by the ability and stature of the man. I'm sorry to have to say it, but Rommel was more important for us than our own officers. Six days later, Rommel came to Berlin. Hitler wanted to hand him his field marshal's baton personally. He was greeted by the Goebbels family. The propaganda minister had offered him a room for the night. In Berlin, the regime's crimes against the Jews could no longer be overlooked, even by Rommel, when his former staff officer was getting married. He asked me where we wanted to live. I said probably in Berlin. I will give you a letter of recommendation to my friend Minister Speer. Thank you, I said. The staff officer didn't know that Speer was distributing flats belonging to deported Jews. My wife and I drove to the flat. It wasn't empty. There was a woman wearing a Star of David and had two children. I was shocked, said, I'm so sorry, I rang the wrong bell. I went back to the ministry, to Councillor Summer. You don't forget some of the arsehole's names. I said, you put me into a terrible situation. How's that? I said, the flat wasn't empty at all and I couldn't move in. What, he said, haven't they been picked up yet? Well, did you like the flat? I will make sure that they are picked up in the morning. Then the flat only has to be disinfected and you can move in. The staff officer refused the offer. And when I told Rommel everything, that it was probably all flats belonging to Jews that Speer was distributing, he said, I don't believe that Speer knows that. I think he was convinced of that. Excuse me for being a bit naive, but it is my firm conviction that he was not having me on when he said, I don't believe that Minister Speer knows that. That was his reaction. 
Goebbels continued to use Rommel's presence for propaganda purposes. On the 30th of September 1942, the winter charity campaign opened in Berlin. Rommel owed Hitler a great deal and as a result was loyal to him. Hitler said of him, He is a safe pair of hands. He is not just close to us National Socialists. He is a National Socialist. My father was... My father was a career soldier and tried hard to stay out of politics. I think he hardly thought about political issues because he'd taken to heart the idea that soldiers should have nothing to do with politics. The next day, there was an improvised press conference. Although the situation in North Africa looked almost hopeless, Rommel seemed optimistic. Today we are 100 kilometers from Alexandria and Cairo and have the gate of Egypt in our sights and we intend to be successful. But Rommel no longer believed his own rhetoric. Meanwhile, at El Alamein, Montgomery was preparing for the decisive battle. From our own observation post, we could see over to the British side with our telescope. We saw them taking positions, the tanks lining up, the artillery getting into position, and so we already suspected, even in September, what we were in for. On the 21st of October 1942, at El Alamein, Montgomery had 200,000 soldiers, more than 1,000 tanks, and 1,500 aircraft at his disposal. That was three times as many as the Germans and Italians had. Monty always said before the battle, this is going to be the turning point of the war. And it was, I think. The um, Russians had come in about six months before, and that was a, obviously a big turning point. But as far as battles were concerned, this was the turning point of the war. At 21.40 sharp, the British attack began. You can't describe it. You're undercover and still you think, they'll hit me, they'll hit me, they'll hit me. It was a miracle that they didn't get every single person. The artillery was practically picking off individuals. Not a foot of sand was left untouched. Montgomery had filled his soldiers with hate. Everyone, everyone must be imbued with the burning desire to kill Germans. If you speak today about feelings towards the enemy, they didn't exist in battle. They only existed afterwards, or when they were wounded, or prisoners. During the fighting, there weren't any feelings. That is stuff and nonsense. It was war, not a kid's game. Despite heavy losses, the Germans and Italians were able to hold off the first onslaught. Rommel's successor in Africa, General Stummer, wanted to go to the front to get an idea of the situation. General Stummer said to Colonel Westphal, I'd like to see the front for myself. I'll drive up there myself. Westphal said, sir, you can't do that. You don't know the terrain. Yes, I do. I've got my maps. Well, the maps were practically blank because there were no features anywhere. And so General Stummer drove up there with Colonel Buchting, the head of intelligence. After a few kilometers, Stummer was hit by enemy fire. He had a fatal heart attack and his body was left in the desert. Anyway, the driver came back to headquarters without his commander, the general. It was, of course, a catastrophe. The British would attack and no more commander-in-chief. On the 24th of October, 1942, Rommel was in Wiener Neustadt. He still didn't know Stummer was dead. His daughter Gertrude was visiting him. 
My mother said, Führer headquarters has called. And then the Führer was on the phone, wanting Field Marshal Rommel. Hitler personally told him to go to Vienna, catch a plane to Naples, and then to Africa, because the British had attacked at El Alamein. 24 hours later, Rommel was back in Africa. British troops were attacking his defenses relentlessly. It was now only a matter of time till they broke through. After seven days, Rommel could only retreat. I can well remember Colonel Westphal, he was our first staff officer, rang Rommel and said, the British have broken through Grenadier Regiment 125 again. What shall we do? I think it was the fourth day of the attack. Rommel said, Get the army ready to leave. Tomorrow I want to lead them according to the mission tactics. Westphal asked, when should the army be ready to leave? Tomorrow morning at 6? No, said Rommel, tonight at 11. And it was, as far as I remember, already 9.15 p.m. The news of Rommel's retreat reached Hitler's HQ in Rustenburg, East Prussia, in the early hours of the 3rd of November, 1942. Major Wilhelm Borner was on duty. In dieser Nacht hat mein Vater ein Fernschreiben von on that night, my father received a telex from Rommel, saying that he had started the retreat. Although this did not come as news to my father. And he forwarded Rommel's message, together with his own precy, for the progress meeting, which was to take place on the following morning. When Hitler learned about the retreat the next morning, he thundered treason. If he'd been informed immediately, he could have stopped Rommel's plan, he thought. Major Borner was summoned. The first thing my father knew about it was that Hitler came up to him seething with rage and in the first sentence hurled at him, in less than 60 minutes you will be shot as a saboteur. Borner was not killed. Instead, he was demoted to the rank of gunner and sent to the Atlantic Wall on probation. At 2 p.m. on the 4th of November, Rommel got a wireless message from Führer HQ. Hitler ordered him to halt the retreat and hold out. You cannot lead your men anywhere but to victory or death. Adolf Hitler. When the order came through from Hitler's HQ that Rommel must hold his position at El Alamein until the last man, he was standing, as far as I can remember, next to me in the car. And when Westphal gave it to him, I don't know now whether he read it himself quickly or whether Westphal told him, he said, I wouldn't dream of it. I wouldn't dream of it, sacrificing the Africa Corps here in El Alamein. However, Rommel followed the order and stopped the retreat. Later, he wrote, We all felt as though we had been hit in the face, and for the first time during the African campaign, I didn't know what to do. Rommel, the soldier, was in a state of inner conflict. Should he obey or not? And soon it was being said that Hitler was mad. He must be mad. A force of more than 200,000 men who can no longer defend themselves, who haven't enough ammunition and petrol, who will very shortly be completely unable to fight, to just let them be wiped out completely, it can't be true, we said. We didn't yet know what had happened at Stalingrad. 
Rommel hesitated for 24 hours, then ordered the retreat, against Hitler's express orders. He wrote a letter of farewell to his wife. Dearest Lou, what will become of us is for God to decide. May you and our boy be well. I kiss you both. Your Ervin. At the same time in Russia, German forces under General Paulus were reaching the suburbs of Stalingrad. On the 19th of November 1942, they were surrounded by the Red Army. They had only a few days to break out. Yet Paulus hesitated. Man can. You can draw comparisons between El Alamein and Stalingrad, and personalities like Paulus and Rommel. Both knew they were decisive battles at a turning point in the war. Both were ordered not to give up one meter of ground and not to retreat one meter. One followed the order and one did not. Nothing happened to Rommel. Historians sometimes say if Paulus had dared to break out, he would have been sentenced to death. Do you know how I reply to that? So what? A field marshal has to take risks to save 100,000 lives. In Stalingrad on the 31st of January 1943, 50,000 soldiers had been killed. 200,000 became Soviet prisoners. Only a few thousand would return home many years later. Paulus put obedience above the lives of his men. Rommel did not. Of course, there was a difference. Putting it crudely, if you are a darling of the regime, you can afford more than if you are a number among many army commanders. That sounds hard, but I would like to put on record the fact that there were differences. That does not diminish what Rommel did, but it was easier for him. It was easier. More than 30,000 German and Italian soldiers remained in El Alamein and were taken prisoner. Among them was a German general, Wilhelm Ritter von Thoma. Montgomery invited him to dinner. Von Thoma was a very decent uh, fellow, um, and uh, he was uh, uh, shocked, but obviously quite enjoying sitting next to Monty. And um, Monty said to him, um, well, I've beaten Rommel once, in the first Battle of Alamein, and I'm going to beat him again. And von Thoma said, ah, so. And then, a dramatic moment, an uh, orderly came into the room with a message. Monty read it, and the message said that we've captured Fuca, which was quite a long way up the coast. We'd broken out, captured Fuca. So Monty said to von Thoma, I, I have Fuca. And von Thoma was very surprised and uh, couldn't believe it. Montgomery had won the decisive victory. Rommel's army was on the retreat. A soldier came in, one of our privates, in complete disarray, covered in sand and dirt. He came into the headquarters and said, it's all over. 
It's all over. I looked at the man and then a few officers said, he's got sunstroke. Take him to hospital quickly. And when I went to the man, a lot more started coming in, a lot more. It was the beginning of the end. There was relief in London. Ronald's army has been defeated. It has been routed. It has been very largely destroyed as a fighting force. Ah, this is not the end. Uh, it is not even the beginning of the end. Uh, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. <laughs> Well, Alamein, as you know, was a decisive British victory. And in Hub 3, <coughs> um, <coughs> we had hour after hour, day after day, these bitter reports by, from Rommel saying, Panzer Army is, Panzer Army is, is exhausted, Panzer Army is der Schöpft. Uh, we have 24 tanks left, we have 17 tanks left, and I remember one day we have 11 tanks, 11 tanks only left. And, I mean, you could have parked those 11 tanks on the lawns around this house, you know, it's so, so few. And we could not understand why uh, <clears throat> Montgomery was not able to exploit the victory. 70,000 German and 30,000 Italian soldiers were fleeing with Rommel. He said, After all these experiences, I can only admit to one mistake, and that is that I did not ignore the order, victory or death, 24 hours earlier. Hitler reluctantly accepted Rommel's disobedience. Rommel was shattered. I realized that Hitler didn't want to see the true situation. He was protecting himself emotionally from what his intellect told him. From that point on, Rommel was no longer the same. It was a real change. He was different. I was with him every evening in our little group. He hardly spoke. Everyone was thinking, what can we say to the Supreme Commander, as we could only call it moving backwards fighting, rather than retreat. In Alexandria, on the 8th of November, 1942, German and Italian prisoners were driven through the town. On the same day, Americans landed in Algeria and Morocco. Rommel's war in North Africa was finally lost. <laughs> 